Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming here, and thank you to those who are joining us online. It's a huge honour to be awarded this prize, and um, I just want to give an aside here of the last time I did anything that was associated with Michael Faraday. And this is, again, the Royal Institution, and it was the Christmas lectures given in 2016 by Saiful Islam, a chemist. And he was talking about light and electricity, things that Faraday has, well, certainly the electricity Faraday was uh, associated with. And so for, for Seifel's entertainment and the entertainment of the Christmas lectures audiences, I sat in a Faraday cage. Now, I don't know whether this was Faraday's original cage, but it was really ramshackle, ramshackle so I think it could have been. So it's a, a, a wooden sort of hut thing, and it, it's covered in chicken wire. And what happens is when you put a great big voltage across it, it doesn't, you don't get an electric shock because the metal of the cage disperses the shock. So they had me sitting in this cage while God knows how many hundreds of thousands of volts was put through it. And if you look at Seifel's lecture, <laughs> you know, it shows me sort of cowering in this little cage. But uh, I did that for, for um, you know, dramatic, dramatic um, purposes because, of course, I knew that I wouldn't get hurt by, by the electricity as long as I didn't touch the cage. And, of course, Faraday cages or Faraday buckets are what we use in a lot of our uh, instruments to collect and count the electrons or, or the ions that we're looking at for when we do things. So I work with Faraday on a daily basis. But so, first of all, my talk, Astronomy by Microscope. Let's start off with astronomy by telescope, <laughs> which is the usual thing. That this, this on the top there, that's the James Webb Space Telescope. It's been sending down some absolutely fantastic images, just really, really wonderful. And, and this on the right here uh, is a, uh, an image, you know, as far back in time as we can go. And that image is about 400... A billion light years across, or something like that. It's, it's, it's huge, it's enormous, it's just big. And each of those little bright spots in there is a galaxy with 100,000 million stars in it. And there's just lots and lots of them. This at the bottom is also a telescope. This is a lander based telescope. This is one of our telescopes on the, uh, uh, in Tenerife, where we can, well, we can't take pictures quite as spectacular as this one of all the galaxies, but we can take amazing pictures of solar system objects, and it's part of our uh, teaching things that we do. So, you know, astronomy then by microscope. These are the sort of things that I use instead of telescopes. And whereas before something was several hundreds of billions of light years across, this is now, well, it's about two millimetres across there, all right? So we're looking at something at a rather different scale. This is a microscope. This is an optical microscope, and it produces images like this. These are two images, one in what we call plain polarised light. So that's just light going into the microscope. And this is what happens if you put a pair of sunglasses on it. So the light is polarised, and you get those amazing colours there. So um, that's this. This is a scanning electron microscope. So this is using light, OK? This is using electrons. And we get pictures like this, which tells us the shape, the topography, the bumps in the uh, uh, sample. And this is a map of aluminium, calcium, um, and iron. And, and it shows that we've got different... Uh, uh, additions, if you add magnesium, iron, and calcium in, and you've got more magnesium, you get this. If you've got more calcium, you get this. And this tells us about mineral compositions. And then this thing, and I use both of these, all right? I'm allowed, I'm qualified to use these. This thing here is called the nanosims, all right? And instead of 
using a, a beam of light, photons, or a beam of electrons, it uses heavy ions, right? It uses something, it uses cesium usually, so that's a very heavy thing, and it bombards the sample, and instead of, you know, just bouncing back nicely, what it does is it drills holes in the sample. And although I, I beg my colleague, Ian Frankie, to let me use this, he says, no, 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 we want to go, no, no, it's beyond you, it's beyond you. Your students can use it, but you can't, all right? And what it does is it produces, well, it produces some maps like this, but it produces data, all right, uh, on isotopes, and we'll come back to what isotopes are. So there are three different types of microscope. And, and this is what I want to try and convince you um, this evening. And there's a phrase here which I really don't like, and that's ground truth. Data from meteorites provide ground truth for astronomical observations and astrophysical um, uh, models. And what that means is, if you're, a, uh, if you're an astronomer and you've taken a, a lovely picture of, some, of a galaxy or something, you can think, oh, well, it's this colour, it's this size, it's this age, it's probably doing this. And then we can actually trace some of the things that have come from those processes, what's going on in the galaxies, and we can measure them. We can hold them in our hands. They're real, they're there. And they're even more real and there than an astrophysicist's model. You know, modelers, they can <coughs> model anything. They can do whatever they want. They can say, well, you know, given these parameters, and it's like, yeah, well, where did those parameters come from? We put those parameters in there. We say, well, you've got to start with this because we have measured it. It's there. So that's what I mean by ground truth. And we use these, these techniques. I've shown you the pictures of the optical and the electron um, microscopes. We also use uh, microscopes that use x-rays. And you get the structure, just like when you x-ray your hand, you know, you can x-ray a rock and you can see the structure of the rock. And we use uh, spectroscopy. So, you know, a rainbow is where the light, white light, has been broken down into different colours based on their wavelength. Well, we can use all sorts of wavelengths, much, much wider, much broader than just the visible wavelengths. And we can also divide samples in terms of how, what their mass is. So if you've got a whole chunk of sort of organic stuff and you can put it into a mass spectrometer uh, through a, 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 a column which teases out things depending on how fast the molecules can move along that column. And the little ones move ever so fast and the big ones are really much slower. So you can tease them out like that. And then this... Uh, here is what our nanosims would come under. So we can analyse all sorts of the astrophysically significant materials, which is what I'll come to and, and to talk about those. And then, you've probably all read this al already, astronomers often have to go out to telescopes where it's cold. And sometimes, if it's cloudy, you know, if it's, the, if it's you know, they're looking for visible light or infrared or something, it's cloudy and they can't see anything, it's tough. In a lab, it's never cloudy. We're not allowed coffee in the labs anymore, which is the drawback, but, but there you go. Don't have to worry about clouds. So this is the cycle, all right, the star formation cycle. And yes, I'm still talking about stuff, images that we've had from telescopes here. And, and where should we start? I mean, this is the problem because it's, it's oops, sorry, it's a cycle, and we're not exactly sure where we start. Do we start with stellar evolution? So we've got a star, like the sun. It goes through its life cycle. It's going to become a red giant, and then it's going to become a white dwarf. Some different types of stars explode to become a supernova. And when the star explodes as a supernova, all the, all the material, all the matter that made up that star gets thrown back out again. It gets thrown back out again into the interstellar medium, which isn't just the space between the stars, but that's the easiest way of thinking about it. Now, 
the interstellar medium, space between the stars, the place between the galaxies, and so on and so forth. There are parts of the, uh, uh, our galaxy which have got concentrations of gas and dust. The gas is mainly hydrogen. There's silicate dust there. Dark clouds. If a dark cloud collapses, and it might be triggered to collapse by the explosion of a supernova, as it collapses, star formation happens. So you get stars. The stars might form a disk round from the dust around the star. And then the star evolves and eventually might explode as a supernova. And at each one of these stages, material is coming and going through the interstellar medium. And so what we can do with meteorites is we can say, stop. We're going to look at some of these processes that have been going on and find out, find out the information about them. Now, is this going to work? Do I have to do it again? Maybe I do it again. Yeah. So this is a, a, a simulation of planetary formation, all right? And, and it's terribly slow. So we'll probably only watch a little bit of it. But what you can see here is a cloud of gas and dust, and it's uh, turbulent, it's rotating, and gradually the central mass gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it gets big enough, eventually, so the mass causes it to switch on. It's a star, it's undergoing nuclear fusion, it's burning hydrogen. And then it can attract dust to it, which can, which can spin round and be clumped together as planets. And I'm sorry, you know, we're still doing astronomy by telescope here. I just get so moved and excited by some of the pictures that you can see. And this, for me, is one of the most exciting pictures I have ever seen. You might say, get a life, get out a bit more, but just, it's amazing. It was taken by the ALMA telescope. Now, the ALMA is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. I have no idea what a large millimeter is. I thought they were all the same size. But I think it's a large array of telescopes which measure things uh, at, at the millimeter wavelengths. All right? So, and it took this picture of this star in the center and the protoplanetary disk forming. It's a real picture. It's not a simulation. It's a real picture. And for us to get things like this... Oh, just so wonderful. Here's another one, right? Again, in the centre there, what you've got is you've got a protoplanetary disk. It's a real picture. I just get so excited by them, but, you know, I get excited by chocolate as well, but there you go. Um, so what's happened then is once you've had your protoplanetary disk and it started to collapse and, and, and it clumps into different things at different, sta at different um, places... So we've now got, we've got our sun, we've got the inner planets, we've got the outer planets, and then we've got something called the asteroid belt, which is a mixture of um, uh, uh, small bodies, the biggest of which is about 1,000 kilometres across, which are uh, mainly rocky, uh, or stony, and some metallic ones. We've got another belt out here called the Kuiper belt, the objects there are much darker. We know a lot less about them than we do about the asteroids, but they're mainly uh, rock and ice. And th this could be where a lot of our comets actually come from, our, our short-lived comets. Pluto has been promoted. It's no longer a planet. It's no longer the smallest planet in the solar system. It's now one of the biggest Kuiper belt objects. So it's gone through, you know, it's been upgraded. So anybody who says to you, I think Pluto should be a planet, say, no, it's been promoted. It's no longer the smallest, most distant, most not interesting planet in the solar system. It's a really, really, really interesting Kuiper Belt objects, object. So most of the stuff that I study comes from the asteroid belt. And here's two asteroids. These were the... Um, uh, uh, the, the focus of NASA's Dawn mission a few years ago. This is Vesta, which is 
uh, about, I think that's about 500 kilometres across, and this is Ceres, which is about 1,000 kilometres across. Ceres is big enough, actually, to be known as now a minor planet because it's pulled itself into this uh, uh, spherical shape. Vesta is, you know, it's the classic potato-shaped asteroid, potato or peanut. Depends whether which side of the Atlantic you are on, whether you classify asteroids as potatoes or peanuts. Anyway, this is potato-shaped. But you can see they've both got lots and lots and lots of craters on them, which shows they've been bombarded throughout the whole of their history. So things have come and hit them. And when things hit something else, bits shatter off. Most of the bits will fall back down, but some of them, you know, go off, wander off, and some of them eventually fall to the Earth as meteorites. Now, these are made of very different, they're very different types. They're both made of stone. But you can see this one, so the, the craters are quite sharp. This one, they're more blurred. And it's because this is actually more like a, a ball of mud, frozen mud. It's got quite a lot of water in it. And in fact, these very bright spots here are thought to be evaporites, like we get uh, maybe in a rock pool at the seaside. And so although there's no water on the surface, the minerals it's made of have got a lot of water in. And it's like a sort of clod of mud rather than a rock, whereas this one is a good solid rock. Right, and they tell us about different things. So now I'm going to teach you all how to classify meteorites, OK? The traditional classification is we've got iron ones, which are made of iron, stony ones made of stone, and stony irons, which are a mixture of stone and iron. All right, have you got it? Stones, irons, and stony irons. Can't go wrong. However, a more modern classification, the way we do it these days, which is much more interesting and, and tells us a lot more about the meteorites, is we think of them as being primitive or processed. Primitive me here means they're undifferentiated. That means they've never been <coughs> hot enough to melt so that they can separate out inside themselves. Okay? So these primitive ones have been very, very little change. They might have been altered a little bit by water. There might have been a little bit of thermal metamorphism, but they've never got hot enough to totally melt. And we call these ones chondrites. And I'll come back to what this odd word is in a minute. And then the other type are the processed ones. These are ones that we call achondrites, because they haven't got uh, any of the classic things that chondrites have. And these have been heated. They've been melted. Some of them have been melted completely. Uh, and so that the metal has, has separated from the rock, just like on the Earth, because we've got a core, our Earth is differentiated. And we can learn different things that have been going on in the solar system from these different objects. Now, this is a classification of all the meteorites. Would you like me to go through it box by box? We'll start off with the sea eyes over at this end and work our way gradually across to these. It'll only take, oh, about five or six hours, but, you know, maybe we'll skate through that. And we'll just stick with some of the primitive ones, OK? So this is a hand specimen. It's a chunk about the size of my fist. And it's of a, uh, from an asteroid, which has got some carbon in it, and, and not a huge amount. It's a, a meteorite, which is called a Yendi. Now, what we do with meteorites when we want to look at them with a microscope is the first thing we do is we, um, we, we saw a bit off them, all right? Now, a geologist, right, which at heart is what I am, a geologist, they look at, look at a rock, the first thing they do is whack it with a hammer, and then the next thing they do is they spit on it, all right? Now, a meteoriticist, we are not encouraged to do that, all right? It's not, it's, it's, it's not done. Um, and I'm sure I've never done it, uh, ever. <laughs> so what we do here is that we would take a, a, a section and we would saw it, polish it, until it was very thin, until it was so thin that you could actually shine light through it, and that's about 30 microns. Or we might embed it in a, a chunk of resin and just polish the top. 
And when we do that, you can look in greater detail at the objects that are in these meteorites. And these round things are what we call chondrules. And that's from a, a Greek word, chondros, which means droplet or little seed. And that's what the first person to um, identify them or to see them in, through a microscope, uh, he looked at them and he thought that they were like droplets of a fiery rain. And that's a really, really great description because, well, we still don't entirely know how these formed, but they must have involved melting in, in some way. Now, what you can see on this one here, the hand specimen, you can see all these very irregular features, including this bit on top, which is not a bird dropping. It's a very irregular feature. And these things are called CAIs. CAI for calcium and aluminium rich inclusions. And guess what elements these inclusions are rich in? Yes, they've got lots of calcium and aluminium in them. And if you think, minerals which have got these, the calcium and the aluminium in them, they are really, really refractory. You can heat them to really high temperatures. So uh, um, the, the, the lining of an oven, for instance, will be made of ceramic, ceramics, these things which are what these, um, what these mineral grains are. So what you've got here is something that's fluffy. It's not a regular shape and it's made of calcium and aluminium rich inclusions. These formed at a very high temperature, you know, some of the highest temperatures as the gas and dust of the protoplanetary disk was cooling and minerals were forming. These probably, I mean, there's several different minerals in there, but these were probably um, the, the first formed things that go into meteorites. The second lot are these things called chondrules. You've got the same picture. You can see the rounded shape. And here's a, um, a closer view of one. These are not made of calcium and aluminium. These are made of iron and magnesium and silicon. And you can see they're very rounded. So they've got a different shape, a different texture, different composition, but formed from the same cloud of gas and dust that has formed the whole of the solar system. So what is the process that has formed, has caused these two things, the CAIs and the chondrules, chondrules to be formed differently? Well, what's happening is you're getting this protoplanetary disk, the pre-solar nebula is cooling and you're getting changes in turbulence, in the dust to gas ratio, in the amount of oxygen that may or may not be there. And you can see this. This is, there are at least eight, or there were nine, um, uh, processes that have been thought to produce chondrules. And my favourite quotation um, is from a, a very old colleague who is actually in the audience at the moment, so I better say a dear and esteemed colleague rather than an old colleague, when she said, chondrules are formed by the chondral formation process, whatever that might be, all right? So it's like, and she is an international expert on chondrules and chondral formation, and that's about as good as we can get, the chondral formation process, whatever that might be, all right? So it could be that bolts of lightning went through the dust and fused some of the dust grains together. It could be the shock wave from a supernova or the, or the shock wave from something else. Or, or as our uh, protoplanetary disk was travelling through the nebula and it was, it was scooping up stuff. There's all sorts of different ways. Now, when we look at this dust, this grain, though, you can see it's got an extra bit on the side. So it must have been tumbling, and it's accumulated other bits towards it. So it's helping to actually look at what has been going, the processes that have been going on as the star, the sun, was forming. Right, now, this is very technical, but don't, don't worry too much. I'm not going to go through all the radioactive decay equations stage by stage, promise. All I'm going to say is that there are some isotopes that are radioactive and they decay. Uranium decays to lead. I think, you know, we're sort of quite familiar with that. But there are lots and lots and lots of decay systems, lots and lots of different 
um, uh, isotopes which decay. So we've got ones that decay over periods of billions of years or what, ones which decay over thousands or a million years. And depending on the decay system you choose, you can learn different things. So what actually happens is you have a parent which decays to a daughter. Now, if you've got uranium and it's decaying to lead, what actually happens is, in sometimes, the remaining uranium stays in one bit and the daughter isotope, the lead, likes to go into another bit. All right? Or aluminium decaying to magnesium. You've got one bit going into another bit. So you can actually start looking at um, the ages of formation uh, things, right? So this is where we go back to the chondrules and the CAIs. We're using a very short-lived system. All right, we don't need to know that too much. So if you've got something and you've got aluminium, which decays to magnesium, and if you've got something and you can find the particular type of magnesium in that mineral that has come from, that magnesium's come from the de decay of the aluminium, you can say that that mineral must have been around, it must have been forming when the aluminium was still present to, to be decaying to magnesium. But because the aluminium has such a short half-life, you know, it's gone after a few tens of short lives, uh, hundreds of, of half-lives. So you can say, oh, right, actually, this particular mineral has got that brand of magnesium in, so it must have been formed very early on. This mineral hasn't got that brand of magnesium in. Oh, it can't have been formed until after all the aluminium has gone. All right? So this is what we're doing here. We're looking, and we can say, right, actually, and this is, this is you know, a very simplistic picture. It's, it's more complicated, but, you know, sim simplistically, these that have got the aluminium in, they also have some minerals that's got, that have got... Mag uh, um, they've got these minerals with aluminium in, and so you can look for those aluminium-rich minerals and look to see if they've got any magnesium in. And if they've got the magnesium in, then yes, they were formed really, really early on. Now, another aside, I take every opportunity to guess at astronomers, you know, because it's fun. If you ask an astronomer, how old is the solar system? They might say, five billion years, four and a half, something like that. We can say that the solar system is 4.5672 plus or minus six million years old, all right? That is very precise. 4,567.2 plus or minus 0 0.6 million years. That is precise and accurate, as we all know the difference. All right? And the age of chondrules is this, 4564.7. All right? So the difference between these two phases that you find in intimate contact within a meteorite, the age differs by two and a half million years. What's two and a half million years between planetary scientists, you might say? Well, it's actually quite a lot to keep things separated in a very active and turbulent solar nebula. And so that's why we're still trying to explore this and find out how this has actually happened. But this is something that's very important to understand for nebula evolution. OK, so I skated over uranium lead and uh, radioactive dating. Now let's delve much more deeply into nuclear synthetic processes. You know, that's a good one, isn't it? So, nuclear synthesis. What's nuclear synthesis? Well, it's when things happen with elements. When you've got, lot, when you've got neutrons around, some elements can absorb a neutron slowly. And this happens when you've not got very many of them, all right? And what happens is an isotope captures a neutron and it sits there. So I'm waiting for another one. Oh, but there aren't much. I'm going to decay. All right? And so that's what happens. It decays before it can capture a second neutron. Where you've got a lot of neutrons, all right, you've got this. That's S for slow, R for rapid. We do like to keep 
keep things simple. So here, you've got a lot of neutrons. So you've got a, 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 a nucleus, an atom. It captures a neutron, and then before anything else can happen to it, it captures another one, and maybe another one. All right, so you've got different types of nuclear synthesis process, pro processes going on, and they leave their signature in, in the elements. And they leave them very particularly in pre-solar grains. So when we look at stars, a star isn't you know, a thing that's there and it, it doesn't change. A star evolves in the same way as, as we evolve, all right? And so this um, diagram here is a complicated picture of what happens to a star, all right? It can start off big, burn fast, die, or it can become out where, where somewhere along here, all right? We've got a lifetime of about 10 billion years, and we're about halfway through it. And this is us, and what we're, what's going to happen to us is we're burning hydrogen, well, the sun's burning hydrogen into helium, then it'll burn helium, and then it'll puff up enormously into a red giant, and then it'll burn all its fuel, and it'll shrivel down into a white dwarf, and it'll die. It's not big enough to do something dramatic like exploding as a supernova. So what we can do is we find products of these processes that have gone on in other stars. We find them in meteorites. And, sorry, this is a very busy slide, but I tried to get, you know, I tried to, I tried to reduce the number of slides I've got by putting more on each slide, which is very bad, all right? So, pre-solar grains, they're a minor constituent of chondrites, you know, up to 2% max. They were recognised on the basis of a, their unusual noble gas isotopic compositions. Xenon has got, what, nine <laughs> stable isotopes? It's got a ridiculous number of isotopes. And sometimes uh, one particular isotope is enhanced over another particular isotope. And so in this one here, the signature, if you've got some gas, some xenon, and you look at it and you say, oh, it's got a lot of xenon-128 and a lot of xenon-132 relative to xenon-130, but hardly any 129 or 131. That is caused by S-process xenon. And S-process xenon is produced in stars which are going through uh, uh, helium burning and various other uh, processes. And they also have very unusual carbon and nitrogen in them, all right? So this is a picture of carbon and nitrogen. And this, at last, some of my data. This is what I do for a hobby. I burn rocks, and when I burn the rocks, uh, the meteorites, I look at the carbon dioxide that comes off, and I can say, oh, if carbon dioxide has come off at about 1,000 degrees C, so I've, I've heated my sample up to 1,000, and it's got carbon, which has got a very low... It's got a high delta-13, so you don't need to worry about that. But it would be plotting down here. So it's something which has probably come from uh, an AGB star, an asymptotic giant branch star, a, a big star, all right? It's not come from the sun. And these are examples of these types of materials, silicon carbide, graphite, aluminium oxide. I put for you know, dramatic purposes diamonds, emeralds, and rubies, but emeralds and rubies are just aluminium oxide. You know, by any other name. So the other type of material that we've got are these nanodiamonds. They're only three nanometers in size. And they're produced, they've got xenon associated with them, which has got a lot of the light isotopes down here and a lot of the heavy isotopes. There is no, no known astrophysical process which can produce a pattern like this, all right? Now, astronomers... When they can't explain an astrophysical process, they either say it's a black hole or it's a supernova, all right? One or the other, black hole or supernova. Here, we've gone for supernova, all right? So we, we've produced a huge number of neutrons in the explosion of the supernova, and um, they've, they've produced little diamonds. Now, again, it's not terribly certain that this is the right answer for the diamonds, and some thought that they might be produced somewhere else, but we don't really know. Now then, I'm going to have to uh, move quickly. <sighs> Where are we? Organic interstellar material, right. So I've talked about the, the um, non-organic stuff, the silicon carbide and things like that. 
But we've got, in some meteorites, and this is a picture of a meteorite called Murchison, uh, which is very rich in carbon. It's got about 2.8% carbon in, which is buckets for a meteorite. And most of that carbon is a, a sort of entangled mass of sort of gunge, really. Uh, it's a mixture of all sorts of different uh, carbonaceous components, some of which have got a lot of deuterium, sorry, some of which have got a lot of deuterium in them, and again, these heavier isotopes of carbon and nitrogen. And what's thought is happening is in the interstellar medium, in things like the dark molecular cloud, where you've got grains of silicate, and they're coated with ice, and what's happening is they're being bombarded by radiation. It might be UV radiation, but we might not necessarily get into the molecular clouds, but, or cosmic, ray, cosmic rays. And what's actually happening is you get a whole, a whole suite of um, reactions called iron molecule reactions, which leave the solid stuff behind to be enriched in these isotopes. So what we can actually do is we can use this as a tracer for astrochemistry and look at the evolution of molecular clouds when we look in meteorites for these things, which is quite interesting. Now, origin of life, all right? Some asteroids are rich in water and organic molecules. This is asteroid Ryugu, which um, was the target of Hayabusa 2. Uh, and this is Bennu, which is the target of OSIRIS-REx. And this is Comet 67P, Churyumov Gerasimenko, which was the target of um, uh, the Rosetta mission. Now, this has brought some material back. And it seems to be sort of, we've analysed, one of my colleagues, Dr. Verkovsky, uh, has analysed some of the grains from Ryugu. And he has found that they're medium enriched in hydrogen. Um, in carbon, but they seem to have quite a lot of water in them. This is my bit. Can you see? Six or seven little black specks there? Yep, they're mine. Mine. Um, which I've been looking at the uh, reflectance spectrum from, and then I'll burn them. Right, okay, so they're, they're sitting there. And so we've had these from this particular uh, asteroid. We'll be getting some back from Bennu in September. They arrived back in September. The Open University is one of three laboratories outside the NASA system which are getting these, these materials. Where one, the Natural History Museum's one, and I think there's one in uh, Switzerland, right? And so I think we're the three European uh, uh, partners which are going to get some of the material from, from Bennu. Now, it's possible... I mean, these are both look as if they're like the types of uh, asteroid that Murchison came from. We've got a handful, about five meteorites, that aren't like Murchison, that aren't like anything else, and possibly come from a comet. Now, the Rosetta mission um, produced... A, 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 there was an instrument called Ptolemy, which was built at the Open University, and it produced a spectrum. You can see here, this is the molecular mass of some of the um, uh, um, samples that came from some of, some of the data that came from the uh, um, mass spectrometer on board, on, on board Ptolemy, on the Philae lander. And some of these are the signals of um, alkanes, alcohols, things like that, the types of material, the types of molecules which make up the building blocks of life. So it could be that when the Earth first formed, it was bombarded by this sort of material. And so the water came from extra... Well, a portion of it came from extraterrestrial samples. Right, I'm going to have to go really fast now. Sorry. Processed meteorites, these are the opposite of the primitive ones. Some of them, like the ones that come from Vesta, which is like this, they're the solidified remnants of the solar system's earliest magmatic activity. So we've got really you know, old volcanoes on some of these asteroids. Iron meteorites, these are the ones that have actually completely uh, uh, separated out. So if you think about how stainless steel's made or how steel's made, you take the iron ore, you heat it up with a catalyst, and what happens is all the iron goes to the bottom of the furnace and you get a scummy bit on top, the slag 
All right? Now, the iron in the core of the earth and the earth, that's been through the same sort of process. So the core of the earth is the, the pure iron with some nickel and other bits and pieces in it. And the bits that we're standing on, we're the slag, all right? So we're the slag on the crust of the earth. Uh, I won't go into the Wittmannstein pattern, but, but this tells us, this is the closest we can get to the core of the earth, because of course we can't dig down that far. So going back to our radiogenic nuclides, using different half-lives, we can look and see when an asteroid has differentiated, when the core, the metal core is produced, we've got the mantle, which is rich in a mineral called olivine, and you've got the crust, which is rich in a mineral called plagioclase. And you can look at the time scales of, of when that happened and when that happened by looking at these different um, systems. And we can bring up this diagram again. We've got the CAIs here, the chondrules. We've got the chondrite formation, when they all came together to make the solid bodies. We've got the earth forming here, and then differentiating, and the moon forming. And it all happened, you know, in a very, very short period of time, really rapidly. We've got meteorites from the moon. All right, I'm going to try and finish by a uh, quarter to eight, right? So we've got some meteorites from the moon. We know they're from the moon because we can compare them with the Apollo samples. We've got meteorites from Mars. How do we know they're from Mars? We haven't got any samples that have been brought directly back from Mars. However, this is a, a meteorite which was collected in Antarctica in 1979, and it's got these pockets of glass in. And when you take out, dig out a pocket of that glass and melt it, gas comes out. And the composition of that gas is identical to the comp composition of Mars's atmosphere. Now, this was taking place in... Uh, uh, 1984, when people were just recognising that we got meteorites from Mars. That, that's mine. That's my data point. <laughs> All right, so we analysed uh, uh, this. This is when we were still over in Cambridge, actually, before we came to the Open University. But that showed you've got uh, the identical composition and the only way that you could get that gas in those glass clasts is those clasts had to be molten. So it's probably when something hit the surface of Mars, blasted material off, and in that instant, some of the um, atmosphere was um, uh, trapped. Now, having, now, knowing that we've got uh, meteorites from Mars, we can then go on and say, let's look at them and see what we can learn about Mars from these meteorites. And um, I hope my good friend Everett is listening on, online. He said he was going to be. Here you are, Ev. Um, this is our meteorite. This is Alan Hills 84001. And uh, um, uh, Everett Gibson and his colleagues produced uh, an image in 1996 where they showed this, which is um, a, a couple of hundred nanometers, um, uh, sorry, uh, micrometers long. And what they said was that it's possible that this is actually a fossilised um, bacterium. And the, the substrate is these, which are rosettes of carbonates, which are produced in warmish, sparkling water. Okay. So they had a, it was a long detective story, a long chain of, of evidence. And um, not everybody believes that this is actually a fossilised bacterium, but what it did was it really, you know, literally and figuratively put a rocket up the Mars programme. And now, you know, we're exploring Mars like there's no tomorrow. Um, and so at the moment, Perseverance is at Jezero Crater. And sorry, I've got some more uh, uh, micro uh, telescope images, or at least from camera images. Just look at that. That puts me in mind of Brimham Rocks in, in Yorkshire. Just look at that. Look at the way it's balanced. Isn't that amazing? It's just, like, amazing. I can't get over these pictures. Just, just like, they're so gorgeous. You know, it's just like, wow. They could be seals basking, but they're not of. of. Anyway, so um, there's a Mars sample return mission coming back in about 2033, uh, when I'll be 75, if, uh, you know, God willing, if I'm still here. I'll be in the lab. 
festering the head of, head of school. Um, this here is about 20 centimetres long. This is one of the samples. They've, they've produced a depot, is what they're calling it, a depot of 10 samples. Now, to me, a depot is you've got 10 samples all gathered together. Now, these are about sort of between 5 and 15 metres apart so that they can be readily collected. I don't call that a depot. I call that a string. Anyway, so these are the things, these are cores, which another mission will go to um, collect. Right, where do they come from? Where do we get them? We get them from deserts. Look, Antarctica, desert, ice, meteorite, dead easy. Sometimes, though, they come without us knowing about it. And this is a fireball from the Winchcombe meteorite, which fell uh, a couple of years ago now, which is beautiful. This is another beautiful thing. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? To you, it might look like a barbecue briquette, but to me... To me, it is, it's got the secrets of the solar system locked up in it. Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Wilcock and their daughter uh, woke up the next, um, on the morning of the 29th and found that somebody had been throwing things at their drive. Um, and if you, if you look online, you can see through the Natural History Museum, some people went um, and they've dug up the drive and they've taken all this away and it's now going to be on display in the Natural History Museum. And uh, my colleague the one who doesn't know how chondrules are formed, she went with a toothbrush on her knees to get all the bits from that drive. Isn't that dedication? Or stupidity, who knows? Anyway, right, where are we? So this is my almost last slide. What can you learn from meteorites? Well, the different populations and ages, I didn't go into the age of the pre-solar grains, but some of them are maybe two billion years older than naturally our solar system. We can learn about molecular cloud evolution. I've talked about that with the organic molecules. We can learn about stellar evolution, the pre-solar grains, the hydrogen burning or the helium burning or the, or the uh, supernova. The CAIs and the chondrules tell us how our protoplanetary disk has evolved, which is not just the origin and evolution of the solar system, but the origin and evolution of planetary systems and exoplanets, which is fantastic. We've also got the planetary melting from the achondrites, the core formation from the iron meteorites. We've got the formation and evolution of the moon, the formation and evolution of Mars, and the, uh, the history and fate of water and possibly life on Mars. We've got the origin of life itself, all from those little poxy rocks. I hope I've persuaded you that we can do astronomy by microscope. And I've just got two final slides. I want to thank my friends and colleagues, especially my family, especially my husband, Ian. Caroline, this is for you. We went to Houston as colleagues <laughs> and came back as lovers. <laughs> Caroline really hates that. No, no. <laughs> All right, OK. Uh, um, so that's my family. And I would also like to thank the institutions that have sheltered me, encouraged me, helped me, the, um, the, especially the ones that gave me money. Uh, and um, uh, that's, uh, that's these here. Uh, and also these missions. Osiris Rex is going to be fantastic when the stuff comes back in September. This, when it comes back next century. And I owe such a lot to the Royal Society for allowing me to give this lecture, but I, I owe so much to the Open University. The Open University is just an amazing place to work because of its mission, to be open to people's places, methods and ideas, which is just a, 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 a dream that we can help to educate people who haven't had the, uh, uh, the opportunity and I love being part of that. And it's really, really important for me to say that to you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, Monica. Um, unfortunately, my notes on what I'm supposed to do next have been scribbled all over with comments from your talk. But, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, I know that people out there, if you've got questions, you want to send them by slido.com and enter it doesn't say up there enter the code hashtag f6323 
or questions in the hall here, there is a microphone that will roll around. We've probably got about five minutes max. So um, a question from outside. Do you have a favourite meteorite and why? Oh, gosh. Well, it depends what I'm working on. Sometimes my favourite meteorite is Allen Hills 84001, the one from Mars with the clusters of carbonates in. Sometimes it's Winchcombe, the one that, that fell recently. Um, so I'm really sorry. No, I haven't got a favourite meteorite. I love them all. Uh, and here's a great question. How would you convince an eight-year-old to follow a career, a career in planetary science which are the exciting and rewarding bits and what are the challenges? Cool. Right, well, um, uh, hold on a bit because my grandson's eight in uh, a few weeks' time and, you know, I'll, I'll ask him. But I think, really, for more and more people to, to go out and talk, go talk to schools, go and talk to, to, to you know, scouts and, and really go out because if the younger children can get the interest and carry on through those difficult teenage years and then get on to university and, and carry on. I think, you know, people like Brian Cox have done a fantastic job, you know, of, of enthusing people. And, and try and make, make, make complex ideas understandable and, and, and make, give people an idea of the excitement of things to come. Question in the second row. Thank you very much for those interesting insights. Would you compare what it's like for you waiting until the stuff arrives and for some of our colleagues who go out to fetch it? Ah, oh, interesting, because I've also been out to fetch it. Um, and that's great. You go out in the field, you go to Antarctica, and you see some of the rocks. And I remember when I was there, um, uh, the, the guy who was leading the uh, expeditions, Professor Cassidy, uh, he just looked at us, there were four noobs there, four newbies who'd never been before. And he just said, you're like fish in a feeding frenzy. We were zapping backwards and forwards trying to pick up all these meteorites. It was, it, it, it was amazing. But you then have to let them go. They go to a curation facility and they're not your meteorites. Um, it's, it's not easy to compare what it's like waiting for a sample to come back. Um, because things happen all the time. I mean, like, we're waiting for the samples to come back from, from uh, uh, Ryugu and from Osiris Rex, and Winchcombe Falls, you know, and it's just, and, and right in the middle of lockdown. Oh, I know, let's, what we do, let's all go over to Cheltenham. Oh, it's lockdown. Mm. Yes, health and safety forms in the universities. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, I don't know, I can't answer that question, really. Sorry. We can probably squeeze in one more in the second row. Thanks. Um, Monica, you explained about how um, we could tell those meteorites were from Mars because of the glass and the composition of different elements that came out of the gas that was in the glass. But how do we know what Mars's atmosphere is made from? Oh, because at the, um, this was going on in 1983, 1984, the acceptance that these came from Mars. Um, there was the Viking um, orbiters and landers in 1977, which uh, measured the composition of Mars, and they found out, and, and Mariner uh, 9 had also found that it, the atmosphere was mainly carbon dioxide, and it had a very, very particular carbon 12 to 13C ratio, and, and that was mimicked. The, the abund relative abundances of the different uh, molecules and the isotopic composition. Any last comments, questions, otherwise I slide across here because the real thing of the evening, apart from thanking Monica for an astonishing presentation that's taken us back four, five, six, seven point something years, <laughs> uh, I love that, um, but really it's a great honour on behalf of the Royal Society to present Professor Monica Grady with the 2022 Michael Faraday Prize for her expertise in communicating science and I think we saw that tonight, congratulations. Fortunately, I did not scribble across the thing that says, and remember to present Monica with the scroll <laughs> and you. the medal. Congratulations, Thank you very Monica. much indeed. Thank you.